Oh, hey, there you are. Hey, you have any idea why I'd be wearing the University of South Alabama shirt and hat on a show about growing Louisiana history? Well, if you're curious, you'll have to stay tuned to find out. If you know the answer, well, stay tuned anyway. See if I'm right, or see if you were right. Anyway, let's find out. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of Growing Some Louisiana History with me, David Hubble. And as I talked about in the intro, well, I've got the South, University of South Alabama gear on. And you may be wondering why, what does the University of South Alabama have to do with growing Louisiana history? Well, first of all, you got to know a little bit about University of South Alabama. It was established in 1963 here in Mobile, Alabama, and I'm actually an alumni. Um, the thing about Mobile is that it was founded in 1702, before New Orleans. Um, so we predate that city uh, by a couple of years. And it was also the first capital of French Louisiana. So actually, I'm probably in what I like to consider part of Louisiana, at least the older part, historically speaking. So that is part of the tie here. Uh, personally, I have one of my ancestors that came through, or a couple of my ancestors, some great-great-great-grandparents, who actually settled first in Mobile in the early 1700s, back when the colony started, and then ended up migrating to Louisiana. And then my Hubble ancestors, my I think they were my third or fourth great-grandparents, they actually traveled from New Orleans about 1826, ended up here in Mobile, got married in the Catholic Church, and then they ended up back in New Orleans. Uh, there's a lot more interesting history there, which I won't go into on this um, gardening history show. But anyway, um, I've got some ties, and the ties between me and Louisiana and Mobile go way back. And in fact, that's not just with me. There's a lot of people, if you start talking to them, a lot of folks in this area have a shared history. And Mobile and Biloxi and um, New Orleans, so the Gulf Coast, you know, we were mostly founded as French colonies back in the early 1700s. And then we have shared experiences between uh, being part of France, Spain, England. Um, and then we have a lot of uh, the seven nations, as Chef John Foles will say, influence the cooking of South Louisiana. Well, Mobile, we have like six of those nations. I think the only things we're really missing are like the Italian and the German immigrants. So for the most part, we share a lot of common history. And then that goes in turn not just to our uh, common shared experiences, which also include food and the food backgrounds. Of course, we would have shared cultural experiences. A lot of deep Roman Catholicism in the early days, and then a lot of um, French Spanish European culture. Uh, then, so both as Mobile and New Orleans go being port cities, uh, we have of course a lot of influx of uh, similar trades. So if you've been watching the series for a while, you probably understand that a lot of the vegetables or seeds I've been growing, you can probably find in Mobile already or along the Gulf Coast. And even though it's Louisiana history related because of the climates and the uh, similar type of soils and such, uh, we grow a lot of, or I've tried to grow, and others have grown a lot of similar um, varieties that you can get over here. Well, during my quest for finding seeds, I, of course, went to many different seed sources, and one of them that I've frequented over the last several years is the Seed Savers um, group. And uh, in there, if you do a search, you can find a lot of times varieties, um, either doing a keyword search on the names like Louisiana, Louis, uh, New Orleans, Creole, those type of terms will come up and you'll find a lot of vegetables or seeds that had their origins or uh, thrived in the South Louisiana area or North Louisiana for that matter. So as you can see, uh, if you've been following the series, I've been growing things that are found in North Louisiana or in the very South Coastal or the Southeast area. Uh, During my searches, I found out about a guy named John Coikendell. And I uh, hope I said your name right, John. Anyway, uh, John has been a avid seed saver for over 50 years. In fact, I think he, he's from Tennessee originally, and uh, he did some traveling in his early days. I think he was studying to be more of an illustrator or artist. And uh, during one of his early trips, uh, I think he was living in Florida at the time, he ended up in South Louisiana, in Washington Parish specifically. And there he met a series of uh, farmers that really kind of took him under his wing. And um, he really fell in love and embraced the community there. 
And these folks, uh, you know, they, they really, he had an interest, a keen interest in growing vegetables and um, from an early age. And uh, this community, I guess, just enthralled him. And so um, they shared with him a lot of their knowledge. And throughout the years, he, being an illustrator and such, would collect in these 80 little booklets, illustrate a lot of the wisdom, the, uh, the drawings, information on the crops that they were doing. I think his official title really is like, I think he's maybe Master Gardener or uh, at Blackberry Farms in Tennessee. Um, but since 1973, as I said, he's been traveling to South Louisiana and I believe he spends about a month or so, maybe around the time of the uh, fair, um, I believe he's in his 80s now. But uh, he gathered all this information in these little booklets and as such, um, over time, you know, there's just so much wisdom and information and he'd get these seeds from people. Uh, and hear the stories and then seek out these seeds and get these seeds and go back to Tennessee and uh, oftentimes even getting right out of the car he plant these seeds first thing his, he would do before even unpacking and uh, over the years he saved up this seed bank so if you go to the seed savers website and I think you have to be a member and maybe go into the uh, ex seed exchange portion of it you can find a lot of the seeds that he offers from Washington Parish and so this year I ended up um, collecting several of them and the first one that I decided to grow is called the Preacher Pea. Now the Preacher Pea, can't really find anything else about it, but in the book, oh, I gotta tell you about the book in a little bit, so just wait. But anyway, the book, in the book, he talks about the Preacher Pea, and it said it was grown in the late 1800s, early 1900s in Washington Parish. So I thought, okay, well, this is a, some Louisiana seeds that I need to grow. But when I got the bag with the Preacher Peas on it, it said Mobile, Alabama. And so originally they originated from, well, these varieties, I guess, originated in Mobile and ended up in Washington Parish at some point. So I thought it's very fitting, the first set of these uh, six bunches of seeds that I grew, I'm gonna grow the uh, preacher pea that maybe it didn't really originate in Mobile, but um, at least this variety started in Mobile, ended up in uh, Washington Parish, and now in Tennessee, and back here in Mobile now, and we're gonna see about them. If you go through the Seed Saver Exchange program, you will actually get to contact Mr. Cockendoyle himself and get some of his seed bank of seeds if you order from them. Um, so for about $4, I got this nice bag of seeds from him. And if you'll look closely, I can zoom in there, you can see where it says Preacher P, Mobile, Alabama. Now, I don't have like a good date on it, but as we said in the book, he talks about 1800s late 1800s, early 1900s, being prevalent in um, Washington Parish. So the name Preacher P, oh, I did some research, I couldn't find it anywhere else except really on the Seed Saver site and in his book. But it's a legume, it's a of Asian African origin. Um, it's, you know, you may, it's listed as a cow pea, but a cow pea is really basically southern field or black-eyed pea. Uh, there's all kind of varieties. If you're just common, if you're just used to the black-eyed peas that we get from California in the dried section, um, you're really limiting yourself. But anyway, um, this is one of the forms of these heirloom, very rare type of peas, as he's listed on there. But they're like a seven inch pod. They're very thin. And like I said, the uh, peas themselves are about 17 in a pod. And so they're a little over a quarter inch long and a little of just about a quarter inch wide and they got a black eye. And so the, uh, the peas themselves um, are pretty prolific. The vine, it's a vining plant and it grows pretty well. Uh, and you'll see in the garden here that it is all over the place. You want to contain it. Pre preacher peas is probably going to be one that's going to be hard to contain because of its vining abilities. So I planted these about April and here it is early August and they're still going strong. I've been picking them probably for about a month and a half now. And um, I haven't put on a lot, but I think part of it is due to the fact that my soil is pretty good. And uh, these type of peas really prefer a slightly acidic soil, but maybe not your best because what's going to happen is with a really good soil, you're going to end up with a lot of vegetative growth and great vines, but maybe not as much uh, yield as far as uh, pod production. Um, but I've got pretty good amount. Um, I'm probably only going to get maybe a pound, but that's because I'm growing it in a small area. Uh, what you'll find is that uh, when you see it out there, it's also got these pretty purple flowers that come out. Um, and despite the heat, we've been under this heat dome for, I don't know, two weeks now. 
uh, it's still producing. Now the pods, I will admit, are a little thinner right now, um, but I got some dried ones. They seem to dry out pretty quick out there on the vine. So most of what I'm picking seems to be on the dry end. And uh, by the time I end up um, shelling them, they're, you know, you can either save them as seeds or just put them in the freezer. So what I've been doing is uh, just kind of culling them. I'm trying to get a good pound, half a pound to at least do a meal with uh, so I can give a, uh, a, some feedback in the future on what they taste like. Haven't had a chance to eat them yet because they haven't really uh, yielded a lot. But I think under the right conditions, they would yield a massive amount. So if it wasn't due to this heat, and uh, if I had a little more space, I'd probably have a higher yield. But we'll check it out in the garden, so let's go see. Unfortunately, I was having some sort of audio quality issues with the mic yesterday while out in the field. I've left the footage in, so you'll still get to see what the preacher pea looks like growing out in my garden. Uh, it's long vining, as you can see. You'll see the leaves, flowers, uh, the pods, but just want to let you know it may be difficult to hear. Um, oh, and I will get to where the name Preacher Pete comes from as well, so stay tuned. Well, as I keep apologizing for the overgrown garden, but you can see here is the uh, Preacher Pete vine. And there is a Preacher Pete pod. Oh, you see okra there too. But if you look carefully, you can see several of them growing there. Now they're brown. Up pretty quickly. Um, and then you've got the pretty purple flowers as well. Uh, the leaves, you know, pretty typical pea type leaves. Um, these are probably about, I don't know, four inches wide now. Um, being the first time growing it, of course, I ended up putting them in the bed toward the back, figuring that the stuff in the front would maybe kind of die out. Well, of course, the stuff I put in the front would be okra, and uh, they've grown pretty tall. Kind of a close-up of the poacher pea here. As you can see, it's not really a very thick pea. close up on the flower. I'll make it take a few uh, of these out, but you can see it's kind of your standard. It's a little darker tan pea. Um, like I said, it's a little bit longer, maybe than a quarter inch long and about a quarter inch wide. And so um, you know, it's got your typical southern or black eyed pea type of look to it. Um, but like I said, they're not, you know, stick my finger up next to it. Hopefully it'll give you some idea. Like I said, the pods themselves, uh, this is a little bit longer than seven inches. Uh, I think that's got to be about a good eight or ten there. Um, but this one's pretty full. Uh, you can kind of see how they're in there. They're pretty good. Pretty, uh, like I said, I had about 17 in the ones that I looked at. Um, but I've probably collected maybe twice this amount just from what I've grown. Uh, I've culled a few, like I said, for seeds. And, um, but as far as ones I'm saving to, to cook with, uh, if the weather holds out, I mean, I'll be able to get at least enough for a good pound to make a good side dish. So, um, like I said, probably instead of doing a part two of this, maybe I'll do a preacher pea recipe uh, from Mr. Kalkendall's book. So as I mentioned, Mr. Kalkendall He's got a book that came out probably around 2017, 2018, and it was actually based off of a uh, Louisiana public television series that they put out, a great documentary called Preserving Our Roots. Yeah, I got it right. Anyway, this is a fantastic book, and a lot of what you see in there is Mr. Conkin Doyle's uh, sketches from his little 80 plus booklets that he collected over time. And it has little, like I said, phrases, um, beautiful hand sketches of the people, the fields out there, and uh, a lot of recipes. Mr. Kalkendall's book uh, is divided up by a, uh, the growing seasons. And uh, like I said, it's a little bit of history, his mem remembrances of these various people. He, um, that's some of the recipes that they used. Oh, I realized as I've been here talking and telling you what a preacher pea looked like about the name. So in the book, what he talks about is that um, 
the you know, Washington Parish, if you're not familiar with it, it is a, uh, it's in the toe, you know, Louisiana is a boot, and it's a top toe, and it, so it borders Mississippi, um, and so it's actually part of what was considered more the English or uh, Florida parishes, which were inhabited, really a lot of when the Spanish had Florida to Pensacola, it kind of extended through there. It wasn't part of the original uh, Louisiana Purchase, uh, but it was acquired shortly thereafter. But um, unlike what you have with more of the Roman Catholics that uh, settled in New Orleans and up the river, uh, these are more of the Protestants that came in. And uh, so this is more of a strongly, uh, I guess, Southern Baptist area. And so he talks about in the uh, Southern Baptist traditions of the, the Good Sunday sermons and the revivals, and talks a little bit about foot washing. Um, he describes that the preachers, when they weren't doing all these during the weeks, they'd pay visits to the uh, folks along the rural roads. And part of what they would do is they'd carry seeds. And, and these seeds ended up being, or in this particular case, the peas, they kind of got nicknamed preacher peas because the preachers would carry them along. And I guess it's a show of goodwill. Uh, you know, they'd share these different seeds with the uh, different people that they were trying to help minister to. So uh, it's got a pretty cool story there from that standpoint. Um, so I'm happy I'm able to grow this rare type of uh, seed out here in my garden, a rare type of legume, I should say, out here in my yard. And um, like I said, it's, uh, it's one of these many various histories of the various seeds that you'll find in Louisiana. So the more you dig into the stories, the backstories of these various types of vegetables, uh, the more you'll learn about the people that grew them and, um, and the different things. So um, you learn a lot, a different view of history than you would say just from simply reading a, a history book. Um, right. Read more of the day-to-day -day, uh, traditions and customs. And like I said, if you get this book, uh, you'll end up finding a lot of the recipes that have been handed down. And these are more, I call them more southern recipes than I would say Cajun Creole because, like I said, the influence is more along Mississippi uh, southern type of recipes. So they're very good. I hadn't tried any of them yet, but the photos look fantastic as well as the recipes. Hope you check it out. It's on, uh, of course, you can find it on your big uh, stores like Amazon and Barnes and Nobles. Um, and also, if you have a chance, check out the Louisiana Public Broadcasting episode on that documentary. They'll show it from time to time online, uh, and you can order it through their website. Uh, it was a great show. I remember when it came out. Um, so, hope you check it out, and let me know if you do. There you go. There's the story of the Preacher P, as told to us by John Conkin Doyle in Preserving Our Roots. Uh, hopefully, you found that story interesting. Kind of makes me wonder um, who the preacher was or preachers were that had that pea and distributed them to uh, the different people that they met. And uh, maybe those peas changed people's lives in more than one way. Anyway, uh, if you found this interesting, please give it a thumbs up and share on your favorite social media. Uh, also, if you liked it, please give it a like on the uh, YouTube page as well. I also want to thank everybody who's already subscribed to the David J. Hubble YouTube channel. I appreciate the uh, support. And if you haven't done so yet, just hit that subscribe button and click the alert bell to be alerted to all upcoming videos. Got a couple more left to do on the Louisiana history before it starts switching over to the Louisiana food. So thanks again, and I will see you next week.